Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the launch of Michael Lithgow's second poetry collection, Who We Thought We Were As We Fell. My name is Chantelle. I am the uh, marketing assistant at Cormorant Books and I will be hosting today's event. We've partnered with Glass Bookshop in Edmonton for the launch, so we encourage you to order the poetry collection from them. Today's launch will consist of a conversation between Michael and Carissa Helton, and will be followed by questions, which you can submit using the Q&A function below. You can also leave a comment for Michael in the chat. Um, I'd also like to use this opportunity to acknowledge the land that we live and work on. While we are gathering in this virtual space, we acknowledge that all of us here live on lands traditionally occupied by the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis of Turtle Island. The home territory of tonight's author, Michael, is Treaty 6, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dean, Ojibwe slash Salto slash Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories and languages and cultures continue to influence our communities. We are also mindful of broken covenants legacies of colonialism and their ongoing structures of exclusion and violence and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Now I would like to hand things over to Mark Cote, who is the publisher of Cormoran Books. Thank you very much, Chantel, and welcome everybody to um, this Zoom launch. And it is most unfortunate that we can't all be together with Michael in Edmonton and um, it's even more unfortunate that we can't be in the glass bookshop, which I understand at the moment is itself virtual. Um, they are happy to take your order online uh, by email or I believe even on phone and you can pick up the book or they will deliver it to you if you're in Edmonton. They will mail it to you if you are outside of Alberta and um, it's entirely possible that many of you are tuning in from somewhere other than Edmonton. Um, not enough good can be said about the independent bookstores in Canada, and I'm just going to take a minute or two to wax eloquent about all of them in general and Glass Bookshop in particular. Um, there has been a recent study, and we have discovered that most Canadian authored and published books are sold through independent bookstores in this country. Uh, they sell more of our books than they do of Amazon or then does Indigo, than they do of, Indigo. I mean, they sell more books than Amazon does or than Indigo does. Um, and this is really important because unlike Amazon in particular, these stores are located in our neighborhoods and they are run by our neighbors and our friends. And yes, it may actually cost a little bit more to buy a book at full retail price than it does from ordering by ordering from Amazon, but that money stays in your neighborhood. It pays a rent, it pays taxes, uh, it pays for people to be employed at the store. And um, that's value added. And it is something to consider when you're making book purchases. So I send this out, not as a plea, but as an enjoinder. Um, try to buy your books if possible at the local bookstores, wherever you are. And if you're in Edmonton, certainly at the Glass Bookshop. Um, this is Michael's second collection of poetry with Cormorant Books. Uh, his first was Waking in the Treehouse, and it was shortlisted for the Quebec Writers' Federation First Book Award. His poems and essays have appeared in numerous literary and academic journals and in Best Canadian Poetry, two, uh, 2012. Um, Michael like another famous Canadian poet, Margaret Atwood, was born in Ottawa. Um, he, has, he moved frequently as a child in his early years, uh, moving to Vancouver in the mid 1980s, where he worked as a journalist and an, an, an activist journalist in community-based media and as a paralegal before attending graduate school in Montreal and back in Ottawa to complete a doctorate in communication studies. He lives now in Edmonton with his wife and daughter and teaches at Athabasca University. Carissa Halton's writing has appeared in Today's Parent, Alberta Views, Post Media Newspapers, 
and other places. An Alberta and National Magazine Award winner, her essays have been anthologized and published in her debut book, Little Yellow House, which was shortlisted for the 2019 Edmonton Book Prize. When not writing, she is a publicist, political and organizational strategist, and mother. Carissa is in a writing group with Michael, and there they are workshopping her new novel. And with that, I leave Michael and Carissa to talk, and I will turn off my mic and disappear. Well, thank you, Mark, for that introduction. Um, thank you, Michael, for inviting me to sort of be in conversation with you today on this year. Uh, the, your launch, your first launch in 10 years, is it? How long has it been since your first one came out? 2012 was the first book. Yeah. Um, and I guess I was curious because I, um, you know, I didn't know you then. I, you and I met four years ago when we first connected via a common friend to join together and start sort of sharing our work. And uh, we've met every single month really since, you know, for four years, I think we maybe skipped some summers. Um, but I was curious to know, um, really, as you think about yourself over these last 10 years and that collection that you, you know, published a decade ago, how do you see that this new collection is, is different? Well, I mean, I Maybe guess first, I'm, just say, I'm just going to say hi to everybody first, because I can't see you out there the way this platform is set up. So I'm going to say hi to the, the people that have joined and also how much I appreciate you coming to tonight's launch, because I know what a crazy year it's been and how particularly crazy and disruptive the last few months have been. So taking some time out to come tonight, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I guess what I think about uh, Carissa is it's the, like in that 10 years, like so much has happened in a way, right? So the, the, the first book of poetry came out and then I sort of set off, I went back to grad school and set off on an academic career. And so I was pulled in a lot of different directions uh, over the period of time that these poems were written. Um, I, I don't write thematically. I don't, I haven't yet anyway, set out to write a book of poems about a particular theme. So all of these poems emerge out of um, spaces of my life, sort of ruptures and poetic moments in my life. Um, and I think in this, in this collection, what to my mind sets it apart from the first collection is I think I'm just more confident with my voice as a poet and what I want, what I want from a poem and, and what I want to do with a poem. And so I think some of these poems, I mean, there are poems in here that go back 10 years that have made it, I've hung on to them and, and, and found a place for them. Um, but I think the poems in this collection sort of stretch more towards the, the future of my work. Now, I know there's 35 people here in our audience today. And again, it's I'm, I'm sad that we can't see you all. And I wanted to mention, though, you know, you know, to ask your questions through the Q&A, but you're welcome to use the chat. And uh, if you want to just send hellos to Michael or you want to, you know, give him, uh, you know, you want to razz him or you want to encourage him or you want to woot along with the poems that he, you know, when we get to some of the readings, you're free to chat away, send your love notes to Michael and, uh, you know, confirm that you purchased the book just now at the Glass Bookshop website, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, and I'll, I can kind of go and hit those um, those comments up and I'll, I'll feed them to Michael as we as we chat. So I just just wanted to make sure that you knew that you could send notes, uh, you know, that weren't questions and we'll be sure to save the chat so that Michael can have that kind of as a, as a, a, a love note. So if you're out there and you want to say hi to him, even just from where you are, please, please do that as well, because that's one of the joys of this format, of course, is that we can actually all be together from Vancouver to, to Montreal and beyond. So love to have you. Um, I think you mentioned that many of your poems just kind of don't come from the, the themes, but really just come from small ruptures in your life. And I love that because it can see that in the work as, as you read each one. But I remember having a conversation when we were on a writing retreat about how everyone kind of writes a poem. And, and you, you talked about the fact that you, you cannot write a poem kind of over more than one sitting. And I'm curious about that, if you just want to kind of talk about that process and, 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 and what, you know, what gets you there to the desk? Is it that you start with one hour and you fill it with writing? Or do you actually start with that smell or what that feeling or that sense of that place? Just kind of walk us through a little bit of, about that sure. process. Um, so, so in, in that comment that I, if I don't write the poem whole in that first sitting, 
it's that's that's what I meant. It's like if I don't write to the end of the poem, I've almost never finished a poem that I haven't ended when I've sat down the first time. I'll drag a poem around for 10 years, sort of shaping it into or looking for, helping it find its its way out into what I think the, the poem can be. But that's very true. And and I think for me, I, I don't have a discipline of writing in that sense. I more with my fiction, I would say I have a discipline of writing, but with the poetry, it tends to be periods of time in my life where I'm particularly, I don't know, just aware or sensitive to that kind of disruption or strangeness, or they often, uh, poems often come out of periods of solitude, I would say, that that's a very fertile and creative space. And so I'm able to inhabit the, 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 the strange tensions that a poem inhabits. Um, so my work always almost comes out of, I don't want to say inspiration, but it comes out of a place often. It's almost, in fact, I think that's almost always true for every poem that I've ever written. It comes out of a very specific place and I'm in it. And there's a, a particular feeling that I'm groping towards and something has happened to kind of ignite the feeling or open up in a sense, the, the veneer of sort of the, the banality of what we're often surrounded by into these sort of deeper and richer and, uh, and more mythological meanings and, and strands. Um, I, I mean, this for me triggers the first poem that you were gonna read. And so maybe do you wanna just go ahead and read an old house? Sure. Um, because I think that it's such a good example of sort of what you just described there. Sure, this poem is called um, uh, an, old house, an Old House Going to Ruin by the Highway. And I was driving through Northern Quebec on my way home from a long trip across Canada in a car by myself. And on the highway, there was this, this house and this is sort of what emerged from it. An old house going to ruin by the highway pulls everyone off the road. It looks senseless, like it's been in a fight, like vice. Weather blows in from all sides, leaving open wounds, rotting walls, punk stairs, cracked counters, garbage of seasons everywhere. It reminds you of crimes, someone else's at first, and then one or two of your own. Window glass is long smashed away as if whatever happened inside needed to escape or be punished. Even the sky above this empty stretch of road seems friendless. You walk in circles around the wreckage, Objects dragged from inside are being eaten by tall grass, broken furniture, a carpet, a plastic lampshade that reminds you of the moon. Wooden handled tools rot in the yard, a shovel, a rake, a rain barrel has fallen in its hoops. The shed has a roof on its floor. You feel bullied by this catastrophe, a kind of wreck and decay that reminds you that everything has its own end. A home undone by accident, by economic helplessness, by what sickness takes and leaves behind by succumbing to age and decline, by the toxic residue of what we do and the worst ways we quarrel, by the horrible silence that follows deaths of those we need. What happened here? Rustlings in the stand of saplings trespassing into the yard absurdly make you think of violence. You hurl an apple into an empty window and from the dark cavity comes a pleasing thud. You make your escape. On the road, you roll a window down, wind roars at the barking doubt in your head. What can you know anyhow, how fast it all goes, how in the end what matters most will be poles apart from what you need today? Something to do in the meantime, you speed until you think you might be caught. Thank you, that was, um, that poem, that I, different from reading it, listening to you, the thing that stood out was that the, what happened here, like that to me is so much, uh, that is like the under, underlining fundamental question of all writers or writing. Like, I think it's like the driving force of why we put anything to paper, right? That curiosity, well, like, dear God, what happened here? Um, Risa says, bravo. Um, she says also hello from your family. Um, Carissa, I, I, I just, I just wanna, I just wanna follow up on that. I think, I think that's right. I mean, for me, I mean, there's so many different kinds of poetry and ways in and out of poetic space. But for me, the, the poems that I'm drawn to and what I'm always, I guess, uh, reaching for, and, and why I think poetry, uh, or what, one of the things that poetry allows us to do is, is that it's, it's a discovery. I think there is really a process of its creation and its discovery and that tension between those two spaces, I think is what holds a, a really interesting poem or a really powerful poem, because I don't ever really know where I'm going when I start a poem. I know where I've started. And then I'm either gonna reach that end spot or I'm not. And sometimes I don't, 
but it's it's a discovery process and it's all tied in with sort of the rules of of knowledge and how we construct meaning and knowledge and then grammar and then syntax and then breaking those rules and then the sounds of the language and the music and the melodies and so there's this really interesting way that that we can produce reality uh through poetry that i think is quite unique now i love you have four um so those who ha don't have the book yet um he has basically it's organized into four um clearly four areas and i love 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 uh, um the ways you've titled them because i think the the ways you titled them in some ways when i read the poems holding the titles i actually kind of came away with different slightly different meanings as, and, and that's maybe not what you intended to do to be kind of um, authoritarian in that way. But I, I do think that the titles sort of hold held meaning for me in a different way. And I'm curious. So this this one comes from the first section, which is called Almost a Simple Plan. And I'm just curious if you wanted to talk a little bit about what what is, what is it that all the poems in that Almost a Simple Plan, what do they all share? Why did you organize them in that way? Sure. I mean, the, the, the titles for the sections came out of when I was trying to organize the collection and looking at it and kind of looking for thematic commonalities between groups of poems. These were the themes that emerged. And so I, I, I tried organizing it, it, it there and I kind of left the manuscript like that and worked on the poems individually, not thinking much about the sections. But what I found over time was is that I became very attached to the sections. And for me, the sections have become as important as the work itself in a way. So the first one, uh, uh, a life, uh, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the title. Almost a simple plan. An almost simple plan. The idea is, is that these poems reflect just sort of living a life. Um, and then there's these ruptures, there's, there's these moments, right? So there's this, you know, you're just sort of living something that's quite conventional and quite typical, but then something happens that, that, that pulls the narrator out of that that, that zone of typicality into something more interesting and more strange and maybe more frightening and more, more dangerous. Oh, and I think that that's what you do that's really intriguing to me, uh, you know, as, I, as I'm writing a novel, doing a lot of craft work on, on tension building, these sorts of things. And I think that all of these poems, you have this way of, and sometimes it's in the poem itself, and sometimes it is more in the way that you've organized the, the, the sections. You have a way of, um, of creating a, a tension that can be a bit eerie and off settling, you know, again, something that's really quite insignificant a moment that by bring, bringing in contrasting points, um, I find you you naturally build tension in these poems that are um, a, a lot more, I think, akin to kind of the fiction that I read than maybe some of the poems that I've read in the past. So I, I just wanted to say that I think that you've done a really amazing job of, of, of having these sort of contrasting points that, that that um, force force the I guess force me to see how it's ruptured because otherwise sometimes we don't see that there's a tear or there's a problem even right like um, uh, and so the, the the second title that you you end up having for your your theme is pioneer and late capitalism pioneer and late capitalism I mean I'm kind of a political junkie so I love this just just because it's it's great and it sounds like it's gonna get political, but what were you trying to achieve with the poems in this, in this um, theme? So, so late capitalism um, in the academy and the academic work that I do sort of emerged as a term while I was in grad school and then it still, it still floats around now and it's kind of how people refer to where we are in capitalism, although nobody really knows where we are in capitalism because we don't know where it ends, if it ever ends or how all that works, right? But people talk about late stage capitalism or late capitalism. So that's a, a bit of the play there. And the idea of the pioneer in late capitalism is, is that all of those poems were written in very rural spaces. They all come out of my encounter with the rural. And in, in I think almost all of those poems, I'm, I'm really quite ill at ease in the natural environment, as much as I love it. And I love camping and I love hiking, but these poems I'm inhabiting a tension between uh, sort of the ways in which I'm, I'm drawn into the beauty of a natural space. And yet I'm also uh, find myself in conflict with it. And of course that conflict resonates really loudly within the systems of economies and resource extraction and all the ways that we you know, destroy natural environments. And of course I'm only ever there as a tourist. It's not, I don't live in those spaces or not that directly, right? I live in spaces that really where the ecologies have been decimated. I live in urban spaces, right? So the idea of the pioneer and like capitalism was a little bit playing with this idea that in, 
I, I had uh, uh, Risa and I, my wife and I moved to uh, Chelsea, north of Ottawa. And so we were, you know, we wanted to go and live in the woods and experience the, the beauty of living in the country. And for me, it was extremely difficult. We moved from, from Montreal into a very rural space. And I, I mean, I kind of went crazy. So it was that kind of a, a vibe. And then when I was working on my dissertation, I rented a little farmhouse even further north off the grid where I did some of the, the, the writing work for my dissertation. And again, it was this really just encountering uh, a very different set of tensions and a very different set of energies that then found their way into this into these poems where I'm trying to negotiate that that space that tension well we see I feel like artist state statement is kind of uh, is a great example of what you've just spoken so do you mind reading artist sure. statement uh, yeah. I don't have the full title of the poem so make sure you read it because it's it's great um the full title of the poem is artist statement for found sounds at the lake I'm surrounded by sounds of insects flapping at screens, trying to reach the porch where I sit and listen to this fuss of wings in the bright light of a flush moon. Across the lake, a chorus of frogs improvise and every so often a loon wails a strange abrupt cry, not the usual arousing melancholy, but broken and crude. Sometimes seagulls join the shrill, a whippoorwill whips persistently into the night and a weird hum of some unknown animal living low to the ground undulates along the waterline. This acoustic paroxysm churns the warm air to a frenzied pitch then slackens. Even insects ease their winged blunders into the veranda's canopy. In this brief lull, I hear snaps and nearby scrub more evidence of a restless crowd out in the dark. And then it begins again, a slow swell of cries as if by magnitude the moon could be coaxed to burn more brightly, or maybe it's the shine that draws this textured wall of animal calls from the bush. All of this has to do with God, I'm certain, the word I mean, out there lumbering in shadows among roots and beasts is a word I know little about, and yet this flux of belling and wood note draws me and everything else ineluctably towards the thing it names. You know, um, so many, th this poem is probably the least political one of, I think, that section and, and this section. Um, you have a number of poems that, that um, how would you call it? They almost seem to like, they, they build off each other. You've got some contrasting poems that where, uh, and it, I think it more comes in the first section than the second section, but where you basically, you know, you've got a poem about, again, your life, and then you have a second poem that that seems to speak to it, but in the sarcastic, almost uh, critical um, sort of voice. It is a very different voice that's speaking back to sort of the poem on the left side of the page. And I guess if people were to see it, you would see, you know, basically you'd open the page and on the on the left side, you see a poem that looks quite sort of ordinary in form and then on the right side you'd see one that is again I guess ruptured might be the word maybe do you want to talk a little bit about what you're trying to do there um politically sure I mean the poems you're talking about I think I think almost all of them are in the first section I think there's one in the um uh, maybe in the fourth section or the third section and I'm, I'm pretty I'm fairly conservative when it comes to the form of a poem and so there's a certain kind of conventionality that I that I hold I often like uh, very structured stanzas or very structured couplets. Um, and uh, I read uh, Tongo Eisen Martin's uh, Heaven is uh, All Goodbyes. Uh, it was published in 2018. He's an American poet. He's a, he's a terrific, powerful writer. Um, and I was very moved by the work. It was short-lifted for the Griffin of people, people are trying to find it uh, in 2018. Um, and I was very moved by the work. There was just such a, a, a kind of energy in it. And, and the form was extremely loose, or, or at least it read as extremely loose. I don't know, I don't know much about his, his writing practice. In any event, I, was, I, I, I wanted to see if I could replicate the form that I was experiencing there. And, and, and it was these kinds of poems that came out. And what I realized was is that, is that the form, I didn't know this until I experimented like this, is the, the, there was an epistemic value to the to the forms that I was conventionally using. And as I opened up that space and allowed a lot more chaotic energy to emerge, what emerged was this very, very critical voice, a very angry and yet I would say a complicated voice where I'm I'm encountering and encountering the 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 silences in my own poems 
accorded to me through privilege because I'm a white, cisgendered, heterosexual, educated, middle class, you know, because that's my positionality in society. And so uh, having this other or letting letting go of form allowed that voice to kind of bubble up where it, it's it's almost there's almost a kind of violence that like at least it's like an epistemic violence like it, it's, it doesn't the poems almost don't make sense but it's because it's almost impossible to kind of to have lived my whole life from a place of privilege and, and to critique it at the same time it's an almost impossibility to authentically hold that space and I think that's what those poems do and so they ended up I didn't write them actually in in, in, in like one responding to the other but clearly there was a relationship between the kinds of silences that were in the poems of a, of a, a plan, plan, an almost simple plan and uh, these other voices. Mm -hmm. No, they're powerful together uh, visually. So maybe um, to the audience, I'll say you have to buy the book in order to sort of see what we're talking about, but um, uh, they're, they're really, really evocative. Um, the next section, the third section is, uh, now I just wanted to say, uh, D. Woodman says such evocative and dis uh, disruptive images, great images and sounds, says Shannon Harris. Um, Michael, you read beautifully too, uh, says uh, Mate. I'm sorry if I've mis misread. And then lots of lovelies and superbs. So thanks for your feedback, guys. It's uh, nice to, to hear from you, even though he can't see your beaming faces as he reads. Um, I, the, the next section is, is a terrible incident. Uh, tell me a little bit about what was happening in your personal life when these poems were written and, and maybe again, why did you package them under a terrible incident? <laughs> I mean, I, I really struggled with uh, what to do with these poems and, and what to call this section in a way. But I mean, uh, this, this section probably has the oldest poems in the collection or many of them come from qu quite a while ago. And so my life has changed radically over that period of time. And so they're, they're very intimate poems. They're very, very, it's, it's, you know, it's like a, in the ways in which poetry can be a kind of navel gazing, hopefully more interesting than just navel gazing, these poems kind of inhabit that space. And it's, it's like the overshare section of the book, right? And so I felt, I mean, there's a certain discomfort I have with even the, 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 the spaces that those poems occupy because I don't live in those spaces anymore. There were spaces that I, I lived in and then I you know, subsequently moved on and, and gone in different directions, but I still like the poems. And so a terrible incident was a little bit tongue in cheek because I wanted to prepare the reader for something really terrible, but then they would, what they would encounter is not that terrible. <laughs> no, not really at all, but um, maybe read Vancouver because it kind of takes us oh, far away from, um, you know, from, from the lake country and then that old house, I imagine on a prairie. I know it wasn't on the prairies, but of course that's where I imagine it and take us to Vancouver. You were a hard city to love, Vancouver, with your rain and pitiless splendor. I've seen your addicted twitching in the streets, condemned to reveal your secrets at wastings and pain. I gave them my pocket change and they swore at me. I sat on your empty buses at night, rattling through the city like a soul being eaten. I counted your demolitions and the floors of new buildings while the homeless mustered. I sat in your cafes, writing you postcards to tell you how lonely I had become. I listened to your traffic grinding in the afternoon and once in the morning from a bench at Pender and Granville, a symphony for the damned. I've slept on your beaches, built fires in the wind on Spanish banks, counted fishers there, dragging their nets through the shallow tides. I collected eagle feathers in Strathcona Park, chased coyotes from dogs in New Brighton Park, met a man building a treehouse in Stanley Park, listened to crowds underserved by money, laugh and wail in Pigeon Park. I've seen your abandoned lots and the moldering clothes and greasy cardboard cots of those who make abandoned home. I've seen the small yellow bins for drug needles permanently fixed on the underside of the viaduct. I've seen starlings murmuring around the Granville Street Bridge like shadows of a mind changing. I've seen sunsets over Ballantine Pier that turn containers and cranes into a landscape of affection and song. I've seen the glass slippers you once let your poets wear. You were a hard city to love, Vancouver. I remember the gray and dreams. Oh, I'm not getting volume. Are you, are you on mute? Hey, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, some kid was uh, downstairs yelling 
about toilet paper. So um, <laughs> I don't know if there's other uh, folks out there who uh, are from Vancouver or not. I'm not seeing anyone in the chat who said, but uh, uh, Vi says, first time attending a poetry reading, whether it will be in person or by virtual means, well done with reading done in an engaging manner, Michael. And Roxy says, that was beautiful. Um, it certainly describes a Vancouver that I, I have met a few times as well. Now, you talked about oversharing in that third section. I think that's interesting because as we take us, you know, take move ourselves to the fourth section, um, it's titled What Remains. Um, I, I think there's a lot of intimacy in this last section, almost more than that third section from what I from what I read. And um, there's some there's a lot about death of course. And then there's a lot, of course, about life. And I can, I can see those stories of, of, of Ren and, and, and what, what she brought into your life as well. And so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about, about that section and the poems that are there and the way that you've organized them. So as I was sifting through the, the, the poems, thinking, thinking about the manuscript, I, I, I saw the, those themes. So during, during this period of time, my, my dad died um, and my daughter was born. So that was sort of all that, all that kind of churning. And, and the title poem, um, What Remains is the name of the last poem in the collection, um, was about a trip that I had taken to Krakow a number of years ago um, after Ren was born. And I'd been to Krakow before, but this time, uh, and it made a difference. This time, it, it was my family that had been murdered there only 80 years ago in the, in the Jewish ghettos. Um, and so I had a really, it was just a very, odd and strange and kind of stupid and, and in, in, in the end kind of enlightening for me personally uh, way to encounter you know how we how we how how memories are are the legacies uh, in the breaths of the living I mean there's really just no other way to, to do it and so what remains ends up really what I'm thinking about there is what remains is 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 the living and the ways in which we remember and talk about those we've loved Well, do you want to read, um, I think what I did with the morning, um, what mm. I did with morning in the morning, uh, I think it's, it's one of, it was one that was really powerful for me. Um, if you want to read that. Sure. I think it really speaks to what you were just saying. Um, the, the title of the poem is what I did with morning in the morning after my father died. And there was a, it's called P16. It's uh it's a parking lot on the edge of Gatineau Park, north of, uh, north of Hull that I used to go to and just walk up and down uh, endlessly as I was grieving um, those worst early, early months of after my dad died. And so this poem comes out of that space. The old gravel road was a perfect place for grief that turned in my stomach like a cold fat snake. I stretched my arms wide like a child's airplane and walked through dense webs of cricket sound above waist high grass on hillocks folding gently down to a winding creek below the road. The mesh of sound everywhere seeped into that part of me now emptied where love for my father had apparently been root bound in the shape of a mask molded from a child's admiration. It was the wrong shape altogether, but pacing over the two or three kilometers of that rural space, what was hard broke on brooms of grass and light swaying on low hills, humping along a thin waft of moving water then scattered into a million notes of birdsong floating against a sky so high and empty and blue it seemed like something shatterproof. A slightly different poem from that section, um, Mechanics, uh, was the other one I think you were thinking of, of writing. And this is, a, this is one of those poems where I think you've done that, where you where you've so fantastically worked with the tension of these two very sort of ordinary things that many people could sort of really connect to doing, but you've you've built it out. Well, and and, and mechanics again. The theme the theme is death, or it's a kind of death, but it's it's the it's the kind of death that we watch. We have a we have a cat, and it's an outdoor cat, and he's very capable, um, and so he kills a lot of animals every summer. Um, and so he started killing um, young rabbits, uh, and that's really what this poem emerges out of. It just somehow took everything to a different, um, a different level. 
Little bits of me are perishing everywhere, at the supermarket, for example, and despite the wonder of aisles arranged like barracks lined with boxes and plastic bottles of food and the wonder of money tossing in my pocket like ill-starred opportunity. Burying dead baby rabbits also takes something away. I found their bodies under the apple tree, one whole and one half eaten, the head half, a high summer's prize for a clearly unoccasioned feral feline. The mouse I saw every day gnawed at at different places in the yard or their bodies left intact in unmown grass, who grieves for mice? But the rabbits, their skulls and half bodies filling with wasps changed the color of the air. I rushed to bury them. That's when I discovered tarps in the soil placed there apparently by landscapers to keep things from growing. As I was sawing a hole in the plastic sheets, the sunlight seemed too bright. They fit the hole and I dropped in dirt. There was a slight brutal sorrow in it all. And I didn't look at my cat the same for a week. A few days later, another rabbit and then a squirrel, an urban slaughter which is why I keep thinking about the supermarket, the shrinking that happens under my skin, pushing a cart through fluorescent light past piles of sad vegetables and unripe fruit, rows of tin and polymer, my knuckles white from holding on to something. I'm there because I belong, I know, and I sense a little of my own desire for death in the shelves, a chance to reap the spoil, take my ice cream home. But the dead rabbits expose a furnace, the yellow clusters of wasps burrowing in the open wounds at the bottom of the rabbit's throats remind me of fire. I'm just a grave digger here, my scut work to keep sadness out of sight, return remnants of vitality to their source, all this machinery of death. My neighbors tell me they haven't seen a mouse in their house since we moved in, my cat keeping his end of an ancient bargain. And my wariness softens to something else, a feeling I get sometimes placing my hand into cracks and stone on a mountainside. Some kinds of death are different. In the aisles, machinery whispers from among bags of potato chips, the jam jars and pepperoni sticks. It's okay, I whisper back, to feel this hesitation. I bury myself in a backyard hole the size of a dinner plate. I bury myself at the supermarket. My sadness a cape, I won't be denied. Thank you for that, Michael. Bridget says, such a great collection of poems, Michael. I'm enjoying your book and how you have walked us through it tonight. Congratulations and love from Oakland. So good, so visceral, says Aaron McGregor. Um, I, I've got a couple of questions. So maybe we'll go to the questions and then we can come back to some of the ones I had. Uh, Lana says, Tommy, I don't know, is that the cat? Yeah. <laughs> um, Shannon Harris says, uh, so what is the difference between your poetry and the fiction you write in terms of process, language, meaning making, and intent? Oh my goodness. That's a four-part, that's a four-part question, Shannon. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the process is so different. I really thought when I thought, all right, I'm going to try fiction, I really thought it would be a relatively easy process. I spent most of my life writing, um, and writing the novel has been so hard. I've abandoned many of them and then gone back to them and then re-abandoned them. And so this is the one that I've been working on now for, I think, three years, because I switched at a certain point after we had started the writers group. Um, I, I mean, the difference is, is that, I mean, one of the things I love about fiction is that I can inhabit all the ways in which I love language. So I love fussing over the, the musicality of language and the density of language required in a poem and, and the poetic moment, that stirring sort of, you know, visceral or embodied sense you get when, it, when, when, a, when, a, when you read a, a poem and it, and it gets into you like that with, with, with language. But I also love, um, I also love stories. I love the compelling qualities uh, of stories. I love losing myself. I love reading. I love losing myself in a world. And, and when I'm in the world, the longer the book, the better. So I love that. And that's quite different, I think, than, than poems. And I also love that it, I, with fiction, I find, or at least this is what I'm exploring to see, you know, how well I can do it. But I also love that I can bring the kind of thinking that informs my academic work and the kind of curiosity that I bring to my academic work, I can bring into fiction. So if I'm curious like I sort of have this research, you know, as a social scientist, I will I'll research and ask different questions about the world around me. Well, I can explore those same questions in a, in a narrative, in a fiction form, in a way that I'm, I'm quite uncomfortable doing with poetry. I mean, I, other people can do it more, more capable than I am, but I find with fiction, I get that room. So I, so I find I'm, 
I, I'm able to be poetic as I need to be poetic. I'm able to be sort of intellectual and, 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 and curious about how the world works around me. I'm able to also be fiercely interested in, in psychology and people because so much of writing fiction is about creating people and understanding the human condition and human experience. So I find a lot of that, I'm, I'm not so intentional and consciously dragging out those kinds of um, constructive processes as much in the poem. The poem really is this kind of embodied relationship with language that seems, um, that's quite different. I, think I don't know if that got all four points. But... I, I think you covered a number of them. I, the fiction you write in terms of process, language, meaning making and intent. I think you covered all those pieces. Uh, Billy Ray Bellacourt, I was at one of his um, launches and and he, he talked about how um, oftentimes with his po poetry, people assume that what he's writing is is um, is is nonfiction, that it's always um, self-referential. And I, I kind of, I, I think it's interesting because when I read poetry, I often assume that too. I often think that poetry is more autobiographical, is nonfiction, but in a more beautiful form. Um, but, but obviously, you know, it is not. And so, but I do feel like as I read your collection, um, and you did see this and say this in the beginning that mostly, usually you start with something where you're kind of at the center. Would you say that all your poems are essentially autobiographical or do you, do you ever play in those in those fictional waters in in your poetry? I, I, I don't as close as close as I've come to it is maybe uh, combining sensibilities from poems from different part times in my life and using them to solve a problem in a poem. But uh, and it's a, I think it's it's a, it's more of a limitation than anything. But but because of the way I engage with poetry and the way I use it really, it's a kind of, you know, self-making creative process with language and, and the pleasure of language is that, is that I do, I really am and, and have felt bound by the biographies, uh, my, my own biographies. But of course there's a, there's a myth-making that goes in there as well, right? There's this kind of, uh, I'm, I'm, there's a way in which you, you know, when, when, when I'm seeing past the veneer of the material banality, there's clearly an imaginative quality to the ways in which I'm I'm inhabiting those spaces. So as much as the the containers might be biographical, there's some room inside of those containers for for more magical things to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we saw that in some of the in some of the ones you wrote, the artist statement for, for sure. Um, there's a question here about um, from anonymous attendee. Uh, I am curious about the discovery process. Could you describe what this process looks like to you, like? to you? Do you tap into your own emotions, feelings, or do, do you ever tap into someone else's emotions, feelings, and reflect that in your writing? So you've answered that a little bit, but got anything more to say? I mean, that's interesting. Do I tap into other people's work in, in, or other people's emotions in my poetry? I mean, my poetry tends to be pretty solitude space. It's interesting, right? And maybe that's another reason why I enjoy the freedom of fiction where I can really begin to explore outside of the, the, the boundaries of my own subjectivity in a much, in a much more free way. Um, for me, the discovery in, in, in a poem uh, ends up being the language. Like it's the language that, that drags me forward and it's the language that I'm sort of using to, you know, like a, like climbing, climbing a rock wall. It's the language that I'm kind of using to feel my way into uh, almost always something that can't be easily, that something that eludes or exceeds the, the sort of narrow limitations of reason or, or, or logic. Um, I don't know if that entirely answers the question, but. Um. Risa says, since you referenced it, can you read the poem that takes place in Krakow? Um, sure, yeah. It's called What Remains. It began with a trip to Poland. Uh, no, that's not where it began. It's where the poem begins. I was walking beside the Whistler River, bumming smokes from Polish youth, stopping to sit and drink and call across the water, wondering if I could hear voices of the dead murmuring in the old Jewish ghetto. I wanted to know if anything was left, for my daughter, I mean. Her family was murdered over there. 
It was Friday night in Krakow. Everywhere the young were filling city streets with desire, strolling on paths beside the river where teenagers gathered in high grass under castle walls above a dragon's den, laughing and clinking their diversions in darkness. Students mustered in swarms in Kazmierz, the old Jewish quarter, crowding the bars and sidewalks with pleasure. I found a tavern filled with faces of dead Polish families nicely framed on the walls, early century studio portraits, I was told, a hipster bar repurposing the past. I asked my companion, are there Jews in those faces? Such a terrible question. He shrugged. That one there, I said, looks like my daughter. Whose faces were abandoned on these walls? I asked the waiter if there were Nazis in the faces. He didn't laugh, but I could tell he thought I was a clown. After that, all I could do was dance with the others, everybody rubbing against their loneliness. After that, I chased light down narrow medieval streets, unsure where I was until I found the castle wall again, climbed steep grass to attack, but landed on my ass in the dirt. Dawn streaked over the Whistler, fuzzy reflections on its surface of neatly ordered trees keeping time. A couple fought as they walked on cobblestones. I could tell by the way they weaved their love was too big for them, or maybe too small. Of course, I heard their loneliness. After that, I got sick eating street meat from the vendor on Stretzwigo all day in bed, running to the toilet, holding my head in my hands. I heard the sound of shit leaving my body in dismal spatters. I didn't hear the sound of suitcases dragged on cobblestones in Kazmierz, nor the sound of German dogs and guns and boots or Jewish bodies falling to the ground. My God, who could live with that horror clamoring even softly. After that, it rained. I lay in my bed in the dark as water dripped from old Krakow eaves and the softest clatter of a church bell muffled by weather rang in the distance. I heard no voices of the dead because what is more silent than death? Over those sorrowful silences, I am the sound I was looking for when I remember what remains. Thank you. Mate says, it is my sense too that your second collection is much more narrative than the first. Hmm. So that's their comment. Um, uh, Gail Shannon says, beautiful. From Gail Klein, uh, she says, congrats, Michael. What advice would you share with the younger generation to inspire younger people to write and love writing? That's funny, I've been asked that question a couple of times recently. Um, in some interviews, and I always go back to the same story. It's an Al Purdy story. So it's both, you know, fun and probably completely out of date. But Al Purdy was a, a Canadian poet who had some acclaim in his day. And uh, a friend of mine, um, who's also a very talented uh, writer and, and poet, um, called Al Purdy before he died, obviously. And Al Purdy just answered the phone, right? And he was like, ah. And so he started talking to Al and he said, look, I'm a poet, I'm writing poems. And Al said, okay, read me some poems. And so he read him some poems. Al listened for a while and he said, you know, you'll get some attention for that poetry. That's fine, he says. But the thrill wears off is you have to like writing the poems. And for me, I think in the end, uh, and I've only, I only have two collections. I mean, it's a very, very modest, you know, slim, you know, practice. But, but for me, really, it's, it's, it's the pleasure of living in the poems. And that is the reason to be writing poetry, is that when you inhabit that poetic space and all of the pleasures and the demands and the frustrations and the weirdnesses or whatever it is, that that's the reason you keep writing. I mean, you know, it's always nice to get an award or acknowledgement or whatever the, the accolades might be because we need that affirmation in some form, right? But in the end, it's, it's being inside the poems. So that would be one bit of advice is you, if you don't like writing, if you don't like being inside those poems, you know? Um, and then the other thing I would say is, is, is it's a double-edged thing, but don't ever be afraid to seek out help and advice if you're feeling stuck. And I wish I would have done this uh, much more systematically and, and, and much more with much more courage than, than I did. But if you're feeling stuck and you're not sure what to do, just find somebody whose work you respect and ask them for help and advice. I mean, the worst they can say is I'm too busy, but chances are they're not going to. I mean, almost always they're going to help you in some way, right? Or look for mentors. Every, every province has a writer's federation. They have mentorship programs. Send your work in, find a mentor, but don't be afraid to seek out. But then the other side of that coin is, is that don't be afraid to um, really own your own voice. Don't be afraid to not do what other people are doing and to hold language the way you need to hold it for, for your own 
relationship with your work. Thank you, Michael. That was wonderful. Good advice for me. <laughs> <laughs> what I was like, what I'm doing. Good God. Um, I'm curious about the, so what have you learned from having written this collection? And I guess two, sort of where do you see yourself going? Do you see yourself pity, pivoting? Do you see yourself um, shifting that third collection of, uh, of poetry? Where do you see yourself going from here based on what you've learned? So the, so the first collection really was, a, oh, wow, I have a, a collection of poetry that I'm publishing in a book. That's very exciting. Um, and I was not confident. I mean, I had the confidence to produce the poems and, and, and to see them published and then, and, and then to work. And, but with this collection, I have a much stronger sense of, of where I want my voice to go. Um, and a part of it is, is that this, this collection really came together like it did because I encountered the work of Svetka uh, Le Push. She's a great Slovenian. She's considered one of the great poets of her generation, a Slovenian poet. And the first um, English translation of one of her books of poetry was published by Athabasca University Press. Um, and so I encountered the manuscript and I was so excited by it. It was, it was so, I don't know, just kind of thrilling to read that I then sat down and produced a, a body of new work that, that helped round out this collection and finished a number of poems that I'd been dragging around for you know, a number of years and kind of chipping away at. And so I was just really moved by it. And I think where I imagine my work going is more in the direction of, of, of her work. And there's a way that she mythologizes. There's a, it's not just mythologizing, but she's sort of, she's sort of rooted in the, in, in, in the small banal minutia of her life, but there's these great tremendous leaps that she takes out into this other world. Um, and so there's a sensibility that she's able to create in her work that I'm, I'm really drawn to quite strongly. And so I'm imagining I would want my work to to drift in that direction or be nudged or pushed or, or forced. Um, you know, I, we're, we're close to our time. We're at 7.22, so I'm aware we've kind of got about six to eight minutes. So if anyone has any quick questions, you're welcome to put it up on the Q&A. Um, but I wanted to give you some time, Michael, to do some thanks. If you've, if you've got anybody you wanna do a shout out to, you know, maybe you can take this time. I do. I want to um, thank Mark Cote and Cormoran Books. Um, this is my second collection with Cormoran Books, and they have been supportive and terrific to work with uh, on both accounts. Um, you're good to your writers, uh, and I'm a very appreciative um, writer with Cormoran Books. Um, another uh, tremendous thank you to Rob and Sarah, who has been Cormoran, uh, Cormoran Books' poetry editor for a number of years. I worked with Sarah on my first book. I worked with Sarah on this book. Um, she was a mentor uh, and then a friend and a, and a colleague. She's a tremendous poet in her own right. And she has, she has a memoir coming out, I think, um, uh, this summer. Anyways, a, a big thank you to Robin for helping me guide these poems to their, to their full realization. Uh, Carissa, thank you for hosting <laughs> and for doing the interview. I'm really happy to be it. here. Fun. It's really fun. Um, and then Glass Bookshop, uh, who I think is an amazing, uh, relatively new bookstore in Edmonton. Um, they're doing terrific community work and they're very supportive with local writers. So I'm very happy to be affiliated with Glass Bookshop and uh, helping to support them through this um, really awful pandemic time that's been so hard on small businesses. Now I've just put up the link to Glass Bookshop. So if folks wanna follow that link before we're kicked out of the um, webinar, please feel free. Um, the other element that often people don't know they can do is you can often, um, almost all libraries across the country allow their members to request books. So, um, and of course, authors get almost more money from library uh, lending than they will from any kind of royalty. So please request the book uh, at your local library, uh, wherever you are, there's many cities here. So um, please feel free to do that. And of course, um, if you wanna share share a screenshot of Michael um, holding his book up on on, um, on Facebook or on social media, here, here's your chance, Instagram. Um, he, you know, I think that th those things too seem a little bit inauthentic, but it can, it is really important thing to, to be sharing Canadian writing and sharing uh, Canadian poets and uh, and sharing our love for Michael and uh, the written word. Um, I, I think that you, I, I guess we have 
about five minutes. So I think we have time for another poem. I, I feel like you you said to me that there um, you do see yourself moving in a bit of a different direction um, in terms stylistically. And I guess I just wondered if you wanted to maybe introduce us to sort of the future, sure. the future collection. Sure. It's a bit nerve wracking um, for me. Um, trying to move into new new spaces, writing the poems. And so I was quite um, uncertain about this poem and yet certain that I liked it. I was just very uncertain about where it fits into the wider world. It's called, it's called a falling of things. It's hard to hold my place among so many falling things like Alice floating slowly down a hole. My desk is where I cling the tightest, coffee cups like mouths, an old phone like a cupped hand, dictionaries like lumps of coal, and a seashell that looks like sunlight. There's more, of course, in rhyme and reason, I'm sure, but the sound and measure are hardly my own. I'm never alone here at my desk, even though there's no one else to blame. Standing in my yard, sometimes it feels like I'm holding something large, alive, and savage, like a lion. It reminds me of my father, of being a father, almost certainly some other animals must be eaten. Pencils are like lions sometimes, a mortgage, a lawn, a roof. Don't even ask about things falling in my refrigerator. I'm holding a line of things that feels like falling down a hole slow enough to touch it all and imagine that it's mine, but I'm never alone enough to know for sure and sometimes so alone the certainty could kill me. This falling is a forest of inconsistency, nothing stopping all of it from falling apart, except that's what I do to help keep it all from landing with a crash because floating here is a full-time job. Then again, maybe it's a fortress. There's good reasons for walls, but they're not well organized. And if they were, well, that's probably worse. This falling of things might be a kind of innocence, it makes me think about blind spots, those places when you drive and can't see your neighbors in the lanes. Maybe they're as necessary as brakes and exhaust. We often ignore shadows of things too, or maybe if that's too much, it's about the materials, the wrong kind of materials. Maybe I should try to reach around the things, the falling, the air, that spot I can't see. It's probably obvious to lions and children. And easy enough, I suppose, to make mistake the way my breath fans out on a cold morning for all the things around me. It snowed again last night, third day of spring in this northern place, and here's more falling to push a season past its need, another chance to see my breath, to measure something that isn't there. I just wanna fill the air with all of the um, bravos from the chat. I feel like that poem sort of described my last year. It makes me feel quite emotional. Um, and I think that you've done something there that, you know, we hope all poetry will do for us, right? And it's why we keep coming back to it. So um, everybody's saying, I felt this survival, beautiful, bravo, congrats, Michael, clap, 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 uh, superb. You have so much to be proud of, says Corey Baldwin, who I know helped work on a number of these poems with you. So. Um, thank you, everyone. I'll leave maybe the last word for Michael. I'm just going to say thank you for everybody coming tonight. I really appreciate it. It's so nice to share the celebration of my second collection of poetry with you. Even though I can't see you, I, I know you're there and I appreciate you taking the time out to support me. It's really nice. Okay, so thank you so much, Carissa, and thank you to Michael, as well as all the attendees who joined us today. Um, before I bring this event to a close, I just want to thank Glass Bookshop again for being our bookstore partner for this launch. Please do purchase your copy of Michael's collection through them if you live in Alberta, and if not, please support your local independent bookstore. Uh, okay, so thank you everyone so much for coming, and have a good night.